Welcome back to Rise and Shine. It's uh, Monday morning and it is, of course, the 30th of April and also the day following Vesak Full Moon Boy Day. And uh, we promised you that we're going to have a special guest in the studio to talk about the importance of today. And also, uh, we're going to go in and dive a little bit, maybe scratch slightly the surface of uh, a religious topic that we would like to talk about on the Poet Day. And we also have with us in the studio, Mr. Vipul Avanigasekara, Senior Lecturer of NSBM Green University. Uh, Bom, welcome to you and welcome back to the show. Uh, nice to have you here in the morning. Good morning. So, um, we start off, I guess, with uh, talking about the importance of the Vesak Full Moon Poet Day. Um, we all know the three main incidents in Lord Buddha's life which is celebrated today. But what more does this day mean? to the Buddhist population in the world. Yes, um, yes, we do commemorate the, the significance of the Vesak uh, Hormon Poya, the birth, the enlightenment, and the passing away of Lord Buddha. Um, uh, but also the Buddhists uh, uh, ought to be bearing uh, in mind that um, the significance of the Vesak Poya uh, has, has a wider spectrum of uh, Things and especially if you look at Lord Buddha himself as a, as a person uh, whom we call man par excellence uh, for the discovery that he made, uh, which he uh, conveyed to the masses uh, over 40 years. The first thing um, I would probably recollect is the, the renunciation. Now, now he uh, gave up an emp empire and um, also, uh, uh, and he was to be the king. And then um, also the wealth, the power, the authority, and moreover the, the family with, uh, with a newborn baby, and leaving all that to go in search of uh, something that he believed would um, benefit the mankind. You see, not many people can do, as you know. It's, that's why we call it a great renunciation, you know, you are attachments, you attach to things. Yes, but here it's different. It's not, not really, you know, you want to detach and then go. But here he found that there is suffering, uh, inevitable it, so. suffering. So you need to find something as a cure for this. So it's something that he wanted to identify, discover for the benefit of masses. And to do that, you know, the, the trade-off was so huge and, and that's what uh, not many people can. I mean, here you can see how much struggle the people are going through to gain wealth, to gain power, to gain... <laughs> someone is leaving all that and walking away and, and that people should bear in mind and the huge sacrifice that he made. And the second thing is that um, during the 40-year long journey where he served uh, the people, and carrying this message, and whether it's a mundane or super mundane, uh, um, there was no, uh, you know, selection of people. Sometimes he met people on the road, the janitors, or you know, people of various capacities. Whoever is interested in in knowing them, so sometimes he might even share it under a tree or even while walking on the road. So there was no, you know, like um, I, I'm not saying you know everything has to be done in a traditional way, but then. You know, he, he walked hundreds of miles going in search of people during his 40 year service, which is also significant, you know, just as much as we commemorate the birth and the enlightenment, you know, what he has done over that uh, 40 year uh, period. That's why we have over 20,000 sutras, um, the discourses in, in written form. Um, these are all sermons given by Lord Buddha to various people who he came across during. Uh, his 40 year long period. Does it also uh, break away from the mindset that right now if we uh, say for example we want to listen to uh, a sermon we would assume that it should be done in a particular way. Um, there's a set way we think of it that should be done but is there a real set way? Uh, definitely no because um, you know sometimes you know people they, they go through feelings they go through various emotions you know, sometimes the time that you need to know something about Dhamma may arise any time of the day. And you should have um, the opportunity, 
not necessarily to walk into a temple or anyone, you know, say for instance, if Sri Lanka has uh, that many number of uh, uh, Buddhist monks who are uh, doing this service, then I believe the service should be available at any time, any given time, not in a traditional way. And I mean, Lord Buddha himself set the example. And we can say that without any fear that, you know, uh, and again, um, when you take the message, it has the mundane aspect, you know, if someone who is in despair, who is in, in, in trouble, who wants to know something, how to get out of a problem, Lord Buddha will give a message which suits that situation. But there are also people who are spiritually inclined, you know, they want to know whether there is anything beyond what we know already. And um, another way of looking at life and existence, you know. And, and then for them, also he had what we call Lokotra Dhamma, or the spiritual level of teaching. And, and then he was ready to So I don't think you, you should have specific times and, you know, any, any, any ritualistic ways of doing things. Um, and that might sometimes uh, even be detrimental because you are not ready. You know, in Buddhism they say, um, uh, the teacher will appear if the student is ready, you know. So if you follow that, Dhamma should be uh, available and it should be prevalent all the time. Some of the, um, one of the major criticisms of people that uh, make about Buddhism, people who are not aware of it, is that uh, it kind of limits you and it doesn't give much, you doesn't allow much leeway for ambition because it's all about uh, letting go and renunciation and all of that. Uh, how, how, how does that, uh, how should it be articulated? Because it's all about, I mean, in Buddhism we talk about Alpe Chotavya, minimalism and letting go, and how, how does that work with the whole corporate climate uh, that is available today? All right, now, uh, there are paradoxes, I must um, admit, because um, the message of Lord Buddha is, himself said, uh, I only speak about suffering and way out of suffering. If you want to be a corporate leader, I suppose there are other ways to follow now. Um, sometimes I wonder, in reality, you know, in, in, in pragmatic sense, if I ask you a question like, today there are a whole lot of leadership programs happening all over. And um, most of the speakers would expect the audience consisting of sometimes hundreds and thousands. They, they want them to become Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, um, Mark Zuckerberg, you know. You know, is it, is it really happening? I mean, can everyone become leaders? Uh, or shouldn't there be followers programs as well? You know, you have leadership programs, followers programs. It should be more pragmatic in, in, in a corporate way if you, if you talk the truth. But somehow, you know, you have said this um, ambitions, the goals, the visions, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you have. I mean, these things are good. You know, you have to go after something. If you talk to a student, you know it. But somehow the existence of the world is such that, and this is where the spirituality comes in, you know. Where are the doctors if there are no patients, for instance? Now, I, I'm not trying to be negative, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But... This is how the, the, the balance, you know, now, uh, where would be the rich if there are no poor, you know, so that, I, I'm not saying that is how it should be, but that's how the world uh, exists, that is how the universe uh, has its own intelligence. So understanding that aspect, you know, then it takes you into a, a different sphere of thinking and investigation and so you can't, you know, a corporate leader, if you want to be a, a good businessman, well, you know, you go ahead and it can work, it may not work, but that is one thing and you should not give up and, you know, all these mundane teachings are good. Uh, another way of looking at your question is, how do you measure success anyway? You know, is it the wealth or is it the, the number of people uh, who okay. are working in your factory or is it the amount of power that you have? Um, but at the end, um, can you measure the success like uh, by way of, uh, you know, like indicators such as gross national happiness? You know, you ask the people in the country, are you happy? And if everyone says we are happy, I, I think that's a, that's a good indicator for success. Rather than, you know, say 
in per capita and uh, whereas one person's capita may be per capita income may be millions of dollars uh, while, you know, and then you take the average and say uh, <laughs> you know Sri Lanka is at so, six so, amount <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not trying to contradict but there are always different ways of looking at it but at the end we must always understand that you know this word suffering although it's a very heavy word it's inevitable you know today actually there's more suffering in spite of technological advancements the scientific you know like probably the life span may have prolonged you know a little bit more and and leave out the the suffering caused by inevitable you know old age uh, and and you know you will have to go one day all that but the psychological suffering stress anxiety boring anger fear it's it's much more if you if you look at the modern day you know people live with fear you know you don't know sometimes if they when you go to the job the job is there you know i mean the internationally that that's a scenario so there's a lot of suffering and the buddhism gives you uh, the antidote you know to how to uh, overcome all this so understand the situation and thereby getting in an exaltation from there as in self realization through understanding the given situation oh well yes understanding if you look at knowledge and wisdom these are two different things knowledge is yes you learn something and you that will help you to do a profession but wisdom is knowing how the the universe is is functioning and um, and and then you are going into uh, a deep spiritual studies which probably reveal things that you probably didn't know until then so we speak of um, we speak of many things that happen in current life um you know we, as a show i think we we speak about a spectrum of things from ranging from stories that happen in the country to international stories to sport to everything that happens in a day um but then you take uh, a buddhist we have a certain way that we expect a buddhist to behave um there is there is always um how how would i put it i'd say in sri lanka there is a certain expectation when you say he is a buddhist uh he follows the religion um how do you think a person should really mold their life along with this to achieve that ultimate um nirvana which a buddhist is supposed to actually be aspiring to have um as a as a follower of buddhist philosophy i i don't think i like this word you know that i am a buddhist so and so is someone i mean we are all human beings exactly. and lord buddha spelled out a philosophy later which we interpreted into a religion as a religion and now we call it buddhism and there's a ism that has come after buddhism so uh, be that as it may but um what i'm saying is a simple teachings like loving kindness and compassion it it sounds very simple but if you go to exercise i'm i'm, I'm asking you know you being young people you know you 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 are in this corporate world you meet people even when you are having a dialogue see the the amount of kind of hatred you know if you say i don't like that guy you know it's a reflection of the amount of hatred that you have towards something mm -hmm. and and if i say why is this you know i mean you come across people you know some people you would like some people you know it's karma tanha bhavatan hai bhav you know all these things are to explain you know that you ought to take this with uh, equanimity and this is the way things happen and if you if you can practice just one quality of brahma guruna what we call metta karuna mudita you you take one metta like loving kindness if you are capable of extending loving kindness to everyone you come across does not necessarily mean that you allow someone to do something wrong it's not what i meant but if you can extend that to the same way that you are extending it to your family you extend that to the neighbor your workplace you know. um it's easy easier said than you know done but if you can do it i can guarantee that it will take you a long long way and uh, this misperception that you know you can't practice dhamma and then be successful in the company there's no such thing uh, but you have to try and see and this is experiential uh, this you know not like reading scriptures and trying to understand but just practice and see how it works and how you benefit and how 
people around you will benefit. Just, just one, one aspect. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Yes, but that is mundane again. And those who, as I said before, you know, are inclined to know um, something more. Why things happen this way? You know, this is what I want to be, but I ended up with this. And this is not the way, um, the probability of something um, realizing as planned could be you know, in terms of numbers, could be 50%, you know, if you say, okay. if you plan something, and if you go back and, and look at your life, or look at your career, and what what may have materialized would have been half, I mean, as uh, for argument's sake. And if you take that as a as an initial point of investigation, why is that? And that's a, that's a nice way to start an investigation and how things happen. And you will confront uh, beautiful discoveries um, on that journey, but that is the spiritual journey. Um, so one needs to understand, should I benefit from the Buddhist teachings in mundane life, in which case, you know, there are many teachings and there are so many discourses, Lord Buddha has spelled out. And, well, if you want to go beyond that, um, so I do not know whether it is a step-by-step -step or uh, the taking the bull change. by the horn and then <laughs> investigating who you are and what you are, well, you know, it's, it's entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I think uh, this kind of prompted an interesting thing in my head. Um, we, uh, some, one of the things that uh, actually our uh, elder generation says all the time is that when something happens, they always say it's karma or like they blame it on karma, some, uh, some preordained, predestined thing. Can you put... Uh, everything into that category as in how, how does that how how can it be articulated uh, well there is um, this karma theory which is um, uh, embedded in, in buddhist teachings as well um, i think when you when you say if something happens you attribute that to karma but when you say something happens what exactly is that something you know if it is a good thing what is that good thing you are talking about? So these are all connected to life stories of people. And this story, you know, it, it's subject to vicissitudes, ups and downs. And all you need to understand is this vicissitudes are inevitable. And and then then the, you know it is the match is over because once you have that proper understanding that things will not stay constant, it will, it will move. I mean, law of impermanence, nothing is constant. Even this is a movement. This is not a, I mean, we, although we call this an interview, it, yes. it's, it's something which is moving into the next all the time. Uh, that's the understanding you are supposed to have. So, well, it, later on you can, as an explanation, you can bring in karma theory and, you know, that's, that's another area. But that understanding, yes, this will not last. Now, say happiness, take for example, and if I tell you from a different viewpoint, happiness may well be an intermittent absence of suffering. So in other yeah. words, I am yeah. saying all the time it's suffering because yeah. human beings are conditioned to live in the next moment. What is next? What is next? What is next? And what is next for me? You know, okay. And that is what causes suffering. I mean, what is next will happen anyway. I mean, if you plan something tomorrow, you plan it now, and what you plan may materialize or may not materialize. Mm -hmm. But if you are conscious of what you are doing, and that is all that is needed, and uh, that that understanding that it works, it's well and good. If it doesn't work, I will have a contingency. I will have an alternate plan, plan B, plan C. That's how you go. But um, if you have an expectation to gain all the time, and that is where you are making the mistake. So, um, exactly what you touched on uh, in terms of karma, I've always had this, um, you know, issue in my mind. Every time somebody says it's it's based on what you have done in the past, it's karma, um, I always keep thinking, um, is there somebody really spinning your fate? Um, do you really know what, and is there some place where score is being kept on the good and the bad that you have been doing? Um, spirituality takes you uh, beyond that that position, really. Um, well, if there is something, it is linked to something that you have done in the past, and well, if you do something good, something good will happen if you do something. Um, what about the 
the circumstances and how do you account for the circumstances that result in certain situations over which you have no control and how, how can you relate karma to that. So it, there is a bigger picture always and uh, in one of the discourses Lord Buddha said, you know this in your fathom long body, I proclaim the world. Now that's a very spiritual um, statement um, through which you can go a long way. Um, and if you take a glass of water and if you drink it now, and the connection goes to the origin of that water. So you can't detach that from that point to the time that you are drinking the water. So if I tell you, well, this is just one, one event. And our discussion and an iceberg which is crashing in Antarctica or something, it, 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 it's just one event. You, you can't separate this. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I'm trying to be too spiritual. <laughs> just to open up your mind, you know, you know, this excessive indulgence in me and myself and, you know, and that I am a separate person is, is a problem with the human beings. I don't think it's a problem with the birds or animals or something. That, that uh, me, myself, because this is, a, this is all what you have constructed after you were born. Um, I mean, when you were born, you didn't have a name, you didn't have a, this thing, you don't have any identity, you didn't have a brand image or anything. These are all what you have constructed. Then later you start suffering and I need to protect what I have been and other guys are doing well and, you know, it's all that. And then you bring in all these explanations like karma and other, other things to justify where you are placed in. Okay. It's not really your born identity, it's actually your lived identity that you're trying to uh, keep uh, forcing out onto the world. That, that's, that's another way of... You know, so always um, what we are advocating is, I mean, I'm conducting a lot of um, meditation sessions. Of course, my program is with the, with the tourists because I'm originally from the tourism industry. Um, so these are all, you know, giving them pointers because language had been a problem um, for a long time. Language is developed to express the human experience of senses, five senses and the mind. But if there's anything beyond that, language um, is not capable of explaining that. So this is why, um, I mean, if you take Nirvana, I mean, volumes have been written to describe Nirvana. But if you try to read, you will never understand that. Unless it is experiential in some way, um, there's no way you can understand Nirvana. You, I mean, say for instance, uh, knowing the Trilakshana, Anitya, Dukkha, Anatta. Yes, Anitya, law of impermanence, yes, to some extent you can understand. Dukkha, yes, to some extent you can understand. Anatta is no self, not self. And, and you are not a self. So how will you probably understand? I mean, I am here, you are there, so we are, we are selves. And, and what did Lord Buddha mean by saying there's no such thing called self? Okay. Then, then you need to go into that investigation yourself. So that's very, very deep thought uh, early morning, I guess. <laughs> of course. Uh, actually, that kind of brings me to another question. Uh, sometimes people come up with this other excuse where they say that, uh, I mean, like, if it's like, uh, sometimes a... Uh, Let's say that person takes liquor or smokes or all of that. So and then, but he is actually by birth he's a Buddhist. I mean that's what he says in his in his birth certificate. Um, and then when you when you ask a person, aren't you going to the temple? Is Vesak and all of that? They say you probably say I'm not a practicing Buddhist. What is this? I'm not a practicing Buddhist culture in this country. And how does it? I don't know whether you can have a, a Buddhist by birth and then. Uh, Buddhist by practice, I don't know whether you can demarcate, you know, such people. And now that you speak, you are speaking about this, uh, someone who is having liquor, and I think Sri Lanka is is, uh, is having the highest consumption of liquor in the world, and uh, and probably and these are the illicit uh, stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the um, legal per capita. <laughs>
itself, there are, there are the pure form of Buddhism, and, and practically from morning to evening you can hear chanting of Pirit, and then, you know, sermons are all over. And how can we become uh, a country which has a very high um, consumption of liquor? And how, this, you know, that is where, you know, this practice comes, you know. So, uh, the, the ritualistic practices and traditions have overshadowed the, the true meaning of, or rather the core message of, of Buddhism, unfortunately. And we need to take on this at some point of time, otherwise we don't know where we are heading for. Well, I guess uh, we unfortunately are running short of time. I think we've just hit uh, time up on the clock. Thank you very much, Mr. Manikasekar, for being in the studio. We really appreciate it for sharing knowledge on every single poor day of the month, uh, of the year. Thank you so much for being in here this morning as Thank well. Thank you for inviting me for this program. All right, time to wind things up. Our rise and shine, I guess. I think uh, we're going to say bye-bye. Uh, it's going to be, it's a, it's a corporate holiday, which means that you can walk around, enjoy, take the scenery from, <laughs> from some dancer also. But bear in mind that with a message, it's all about spirituality. It's all about, you know, practicing everything in moderation. And this is me, Indra. Uh, and it's, it's me, Indra, and myself saying bye-bye. Three See people. Tomorrow. <laughs> people in here. Why things up. Bye-bye, folks. Rise and shine's back tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Bye-bye.